Hello everyone, welcome to the brand new Medical Projects YouTube channel. So my guess is you're all new around here, so I'm going to start off this video by introducing myself and Medical Projects. So my name is Olivia, I am a second year medical student studying at King's College London and here at Medical Projects we're all about supporting you and your medical school application to ensure that you have the best possible chances of getting into medical school. We're here to help you with your work experience queries, with your admissions test queries and any other general questions you may have about the medical school application. If you're unfamiliar with the medical school application, it is a very long process. It can seem quite daunting initially, but if you get the correct advice and you really apply yourself, there's no reason you can't get that coveted spot at medical school. So for today's video, I thought we'd talk about a very relevant topic and that's going to be on admissions tests. Now, the reason we're doing this video is because admissions tests are rapidly coming up. They usually happen in the summer before your medical school application. So many of you will be sitting your admissions test this summer. So what are the admissions tests and why do we have to sit them for our medical school application? Well, most universities use these in order to rank individuals and give them interviews. There are many different medical school admissions tests that you may need to take and you need to check on the university website to see which one is applicable to you. Some universities will use the BMAT exam, some universities will use the U CAT exam and other ones may use the GAMSAT exam if you're applying as a graduate. Now today I thought I'd talk about the UCAT exam because I actually sat that exam myself and it is an exam that many universities will be using. Now if you're unfamiliar with the UCAT exam it stands for University Clinical Aptitude Test and it is a two hour online examination that many of you will be sitting in order to apply to medical school. It's comprised of five individual sections and tests various different skills. So in today's video I thought I'd give a broad overview of the exam offering my tips and tricks in each individual sections. It is worth pointing out obviously that this year is quite a unique one due to, well, a global pandemic. And there will be some changes that you'll be facing with the UCAT exam format this year. But I'll be covering that in a separate video coming very soon. So as previously mentioned, the exam is comprised of five individual sections and within each section, you get a score ranging from 300 to 900. 900 obviously being the highest you can possibly get. Now, obviously the aim of the exam is to get as high as possible because that will increase your chance of interview. So I hope you find this video useful and you can apply some of the tips and tricks that I teach you to your own examination practice. Now, before we start this test, I thought I'd just take a brief moment to dispel any myths surrounding the exam. So firstly, you can't study for the UCAT exam. Now, many people told me this and you often hear this, especially on online forums. However, do not fall into this trap. Whilst the UCAT exam is an aptitude test and a lot of it rests on getting the timing correct, the more you practice, the better you will do. I can promise you this for an absolute fact. There are certain skills and techniques that you can practice and utilize throughout your exam. And not only is that gonna make you quicker, but it's gonna make you much more accurate as well. So for all of those telling you that you can't practice, ignore them ignore them. So without further ado, let's start with our first section of the exam and that is going to be verbal reasoning. The verbal reasoning portion of the exam is comprised of 44 questions that you are expected to answer in 21 minutes. So what is verbal reasoning? It's basically a section which is assessing your ability to quickly read a passage of information and then answer questions based on the information that you've read in the passage. Now, this is, in my opinion, the most time pressured section of the exam because often the passages are really quite big and the answers to the questions being asked are really well hidden and embedded within the passage. Within this section, you may come across two different formats of questions. These will either fall into the true, false, can't tell category, or they might be free text questions, which is basically where they can ask any anything about the passage. Now, for the true, false, can't tell questions, it's a case of reading the passage and answering whether what they're asking in the question is true, which means the passage directly confirms that statement, false, which means the passage completely opposes the question, or can't tell, which means based on the information provided in the passage, there is insufficient evidence to prove or disprove the statement being said. Now, the true, false, can't tell questions are, in my opinion, significantly easier than the free text questions. Now, with these type of questions, I believe that the best technique to use is the scan the text and look for the key words being mentioned in the question technique. Obviously the UCAT exam is very time pressured, especially this section. You do not have time to be reading all the passages and then looking at all the different questions and answers because you will run out of time and that will lose you your marks. So instead what I recommend you do with these questions is look for the key words in the question. So for example they might say this policy was introduced in 2010. True, false, can't tell. Now what I would 
then do is I'd look in the passage and try scan for the word 2010. And then what I would do is I'd read the sentence incorporating that keyword, read the sentence above and below to make sure I'm not missing any contradictory text, for example, and then I would answer the question that way. Now for the free text questions, these are a bit more tricky because what it requires you to do is read four individual answers and see which answer best fits what's being implied in the text. I believe the keyword technique can still be used here, but in these questions, maybe set aside a little more time to skim read the passage if time permits. There really is no golden technique to this section, it's just a case of familiarising yourself with long passages of text and really practising your speed reading. Finally, as with every section, like I mentioned, it's time pressured, so if you can't find the answer or if you're running out of time, do not leave questions unanswered guess the question, flag it and move on. Remember the UCAT exam is not negatively marked so it's better to give an answer than none at all. Moving on to the second section of the exam, this is going to be decision making. This section requires you to answer 29 questions in 31 minutes and is not as time pressured in my opinion as the previous section. Now this is a fairly new section so my first bit of advice is make sure that any resources that you may be utilising incorporates the new format of the UCAT exam. You don't want to be practising something that's going to be irrelevant. This section is also an interesting one because it is comprised of six different subsets of questions. I've got them here for you and these are going to fall into either logical puzzles, syllogisms, data interpretation, assumptions questions, diagrams and probabilities. So make sure you are familiar with all of these and make sure you're practicing each type carefully. It's really tempting with these sort of exams to just practice the things you're good at because that builds your confidence up and you know whilst that is great it's not going to help you improve your score if you're not practicing the things you're weaker at. My next tip with this section is to utilize your whiteboard. There are going to be some different features available to you this year due to COVID and one of those is going to be a scratch pad. So for example in the case of logical puzzles it's much easier to work out the answer if you're able to draw out all the different bits of information they're giving you. I did this a lot in my exam and it made it so much easier on me. I think you'll actually quite enjoy this section. There's a lot of different types of questions, so it's definitely not a boring one to practice. And it does become really straightforward if you nail the different subsets of questions. Also, do not underestimate your basic mathematical skills. This is something you're gonna have to practice anyway for the following section. So you may as well utilize your basic mathematical skills here. So for example, if you've got some simple equations, try and work them out in your head instead of having to use a calculator, because again, it will just make you that much quicker once again, this is going to be a very common theme in this video. If you don't know the answer, guess it, flag it and move on. You may have time to come back to it in the end. And remember, this exam is not negatively marked. Moving on to the third section of the exam actually was my arch nemesis when practicing. This is going to be quantitative reasoning. Now, this section requires you to answer 36 questions in 24 minutes. Now, if you're not a maths fanatic like myself, this might be a section that you're really, really intimidated by. And it definitely was the case for me. I didn't even take A-level mathematics, so I assumed that this portion of the exam would be asking me to rearrange complex algebraic formulas and I just was gonna fail miserably. Now, I'm here to give you the much needed confidence boost you need for this section because trust me, the real exam is quite straightforward if you nail basic maths. So my first bit of advice is to check out BBC Bite Size. Familiarise yourself with really basic maths like speed equals distance divided by time equations, percentages, averages and different formulas that you need to use. Look at things like areas of shapes. The way you're going to trip up on this section is if you're not familiar with what formula is needed. My second bit of advice with this section is triage your questions. Within the UCAT exam, Everything is equally marked, which means you're not going to score higher in a quantitative reasoning question which is significantly harder, as opposed to one that is very easy. This means if you come across a really, really difficult maths problem or you just think there is so much information here, I'm going to use, you know, a quarter of my time on this one question, triage it. What I mean by this is just answer as best as you can, maybe even just pick a random answer and move on because chances are there's going to be so many other questions that are way more simple to answer and will take you like this much time to answer. My next bit of advice for this section, see this, get rid of it. You're not gonna need it. You're not actually allowed to use a real calculator in the exam. And that is a bit of a bummer because I'm way quicker on a real calculator. Instead, what you're given is an on-screen calculator and it is essential that you practice with this. There's no point practicing with a real calculator and then in the real exam, realizing that actually you're way slower with the on-screen calculator. I recommend using your keypad and learning the different shortcuts for divisions and multiplications. And also, even though you do have the calculator available to you, you're not going to need it that often if you improve your basic mental maths and that's gonna save you precious seconds. Finally, my last bit of advice for this section is 
pay attention to your units. There's gonna be loads of questions which is just assessing your ability to convert between basic units. For example, grams, kilograms, centimeters, meters, and it's so frustrating when you lose out on easy marks when you've done the equation but you just haven't converted properly. Now moving on to the fourth section of the exam, you're over halfway, do not lose steam. This is abstract reasoning and it requires you to answer 55 questions in 13 minutes. Don't you love this exam? I know that appears really time pressured and yes it is, but again, as with everything in this exam, if you keep on practicing, use loads of question banks, practice all the different types of questions, you're going to get quicker. So what does this section entail? Because it's actually unlike anything I've ever come across before. Now again, this section is comprised of two different types of sub questions. You're either going to get the questions which ask you whether the test shape you're given belongs in set A, set B, or neither or you're gonna get some questions where it asks you to complete the series given to you. This section is a little bit of a minefield when you start out, I'm not gonna lie. It's kind of the section that feels like you're just never gonna master it because it's just not a skill that we're very familiar with using. So here are my top tips to help make that section a little bit more manageable. My first tip is to look at the simplest shape within each set. My reasoning for this is because within set A and set B, they're going to follow the same general pattern with a difference. So for example, the pattern might be this. In set A, I notice that there's a triangle in the top left corner that's white. And in set B, I notice that the triangles in the top left hand corner are always black. My test shape given to me has a black triangle in the top left corner. So I've determined that that belongs to set B. I know that's a bit of an oversimplification, but for an example, that's what I'm gonna use. All the boxes within set A will follow the same pattern and all the boxes within set B are gonna follow the same pattern. So you might as well compare the boxes which have the least amount going on because it's just simpler. My next bit of advice is to utilize a mnemonic. This is because it gives you a really systematic way of being able to work out what is going on within each set. So the one that I used during my exam was SCANS. What does SCAN stand for, you may be asking me? Well, it stands for shape, color, arrangement, number of shape and size of shape. And also you can incorporate like symmetry if that's something that you notice. So how would I use this? Well, I'd look at my test shape and I'd look at the different sets. Initially, what you want to do is identify what pattern is being shown in set A and set B. So I might use the mnemonic scans and say shape. Can I see any different shapes? Is there any pattern to do with what type of shape is present? Color, can I identify a reoccurring pattern which revolves around the color of the shape? Or arrangement, can I see that actually all the shapes are in the top left hand corner in this set and all the shapes are in the bottom right hand corner in this set. If you use this mnemonic and apply it when you're doing your practice, it will make it that much easier and you'll notice that when you're doing your exam, you literally run through it without even thinking. To go along with this bit of advice, I really, really recommend you make a list of all the patterns that you see, any novel patterns you see especially. This means that before your exam, you can just run through the list of patterns you've seen and it honestly just implants it in your brain. Obviously that's only gonna work if you do tons of practice. So the golden rule to this exam is practice, practice, practice. My final bit of advice for abstract reasoning is ignore distractions. They're so frustrating, they don't make it easy for you. So for example, whilst in one question the pattern may actually revolve around the colour of the shape, in another question that might not be the case and they might actually use colour as a distracting factor. And finally, we have made it to the final section my favourite section of the exam is the situational judgement section. This is comprised of 69 questions that you must answer in 26 minutes. Now situational judgement is basically the section where you're pretending you're a doctor or a medical student. You're reading the situations being presented to you and you're deciding how you would act as if you were a professional. Now once again you're going to have two different types of questions within this section. The scoring for this section is a little bit unique because as I've said throughout this video, things are equally marked. However, in situational judgment, it's a bit different. Let's take the appropriateness questions, for example. You may answer and say, for example, what this doctor did was a very appropriate thing to do. But the actual answer was, it was just an appropriate thing to do. It wasn't really the most appropriate thing to do. Now, if you manage to answer that it was indeed appropriate, i.e. you didn't say that it wasn't inappropriate, you'll get half marks even if it is not the fully correct answer. However, if you choose to answer that this was a very appropriate thing to do, but in actual fact the real answer was it was a highly inappropriate thing to do, you're gonna get zero marks. My point being with this is that you always need to decide between that 50-50 line. You need to be making sure that you're at least getting within the ballpark of the real answer of the question. So I guess my ultimate tip with this section is think like you are a professional and think like you are a doctor adhering to numerous policies and regulatory bodies 
companies and think about just minimizing any possibility of you getting into trouble. These questions will all revolve around really distinct reoccurring themes. For example, trust, professionalism, respect, minimizing error and avoiding anything that may be a detriment to patient safety. So how can you improve with this section and become familiar with these themes? Well, I believe the GMC has a document called Tomorrow's Doctors. That's a document which outlines the professional expectations of a doctor and the things that you should be demonstrating in your daily practice. You may also want to read the NHS constitution and just keep practicing these questions because you will see the same themes come up again and again. So finally, we've reached the end of the exam. This is a big exam. I know all this information can seem really overwhelming, but try and take some general tips away from this video and utilize these in your own practice. The more practice you do, the better you'll become, and then you can start putting those time pressures on to make sure you're answering things in a timely fashion. I guess the final thing to say is best of luck if you're taking the exam this summer. We're all here to help you. Make sure you check out the Medical Projects website. I'll leave the link in the description box below because you'll find some really useful resources to help you with your medical school application. And before you know it, you're gonna be in medical school and having the best time of your life. Please make sure you like and subscribe to this channel, turn the notification bell on, and as ever, if you have any requests for videos you'd like to see, leave them in the comment section below. I hope you guys have a great day and I'll talk to you soon.